Um, and then um, we'll have time for some uh, questions and answers and uh, and everything else. So um, if you do have questions during the session, please uh, log them in the chat. I'll I have got the chat visible, so hopefully uh, I'll be able to keep an eye on and uh, see what's going on and hopefully get a feel for that. Um, a bit about me. Um, and I will say there are some QR codes um, that you may uh, want to take advantage of. I'll also post the links that this QR code um, kind of takes you to uh, in the chat. Um, I've been working with Dynamics since version three. Um, I'm very passionate about all things like mental health, accessibility, um, community, diversity, inclusion. Um, during my rather long career so far in IT, I've done every job under the sun, so I've worn every hat, got every T-shirt, got all the scars, um, got all the um, bad nightmares um, and a lot of good memories. Um, and I'm also the founder and co-host of the Things We Don't Talk About podcast. And yeah, you can connect with me on those links, um, which I have posted in the chat as well. So. Let me get back into PowerPoint here. Quick bit about accessibility, because when you say the word accessibility, the first thing that people think of is disability and they think of wheelchairs tends to be the kind of common reaction and common thought um, but the definition of accessibility is the ability to access and benefit from a system or entity very 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 wordy way of of putting it but basically Accessibility is all about making it easy for people to be able to use the tools that we build, the software that we use. Is it easy for people, irrespective of any challenges they face or circumstances they live with, is it easy for them to use it? And some of it is and some of it isn't. And there are lots of challenges and a lot of people have kind of worked their way around things. And you don't have to be disabled to use accessibility. For example, at the moment, I haven't got it switched on because if I did, I'd look as orange as Donald Trump and nobody wants that. Um, but I have a blue light filter which makes my screen look very very yellow and orange um, because if I sit in front of a bright white screen I get a migraine um, if I sit in front of it all day now that color filter thing is an accessibility tool because the white light gives me a migraine when I've got too much of it that's not a disability but it's an accessibility thing um, subtitles, 80% of people who use subtitles do not have a disability. Or they're not, certainly not deaf. I think they get used in bars, they get used in gyms, um, they get used by people watching foreign language movies and all things like that. So th there are lots of reasons why we might use accessibility tools which kind of then makes this it's the elephant in the room that most people tend to think of is I don't know anybody who uses accessibility tools well actually you probably do um, in fact it's more likely that you do than you don't um, because when we look at ac uh, accessibility and some of the statistics that are around it and why we need it over 1.3 billion people worldwide have a registered disability. 
the key word there is registered. In the UK, one in five working age adults have a registered disability. 70% of disabilities are hidden. That means either they're not visible, so you can't see them. Um, there's no sort of wheelchair or white cane or guide dog or hearing aid or anything else. Or they're being actively hidden um, because of stigma and some of the shame that people can unduly feel for having a disability. There are also those who are not registered disabled. So I have um, a degenerative spinal disorder. And it affects my fine motor control, it affects what I can feel and different days I have different. Um, levels. I'm not registered disabled, although I could be. So I don't feature in that 1.3 billion number. I don't feature in that one in five. There are a lot of people who are not registered disabled, which is why I say the word registered is very key here. And when we look globally, accessibility is legally required in a lot of what we do. So if you do any work with UK government websites or building internal systems or apps or anything else, they've got to be accessible. That's a legal requirement. The European Accessibility Act got signed in June this year. It becomes law in 2025. And it means that if you do any business in the EU or with EU companies, the digital content you produce, be it an app, be it a website, be it documents, be it presentations, whatever, they have got to be accessible. It will be legally required. The UK is likely to copy that. Um, we'll probably do a search and replace and change European for British Accessibility Act, knowing our government at the moment. And then in America, you've got the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 508. Again, defining the need for accessibility. And this is going to be more and more important um, as we go on more organisations, more countries are going to mandate that we've got to include accessibility in what we do. So I'm going to introduce you to a couple of new acronyms um, because let's be honest, IT, we've got to have acronyms. Um, and these are kind of the rules, um, the standards that define accessibility. So first up, we have WCAG, WCAG. And then we have ARIA. We do know I'm not going to burst into uh, an operetta and sing you a nice tune. Nobody wants to hear that, trust me. WCAG, it stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And ARIA is Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Both of these have been created by the World Wide Web Consortium. In fact, ARIA is kind of the technical in-depth guts and details of the WCAG specification. And what these were designed to do, WCAG was built to design or to help guide in what standards should accessible web content meet? How, how should you go about building accessible websites? And ARIA kind of then takes that a bit more in depth as to, OK, how do we structure our pages? How do we structure any Internet applications so that they work well with things like 
screen readers or um, or anything else. And these two, although they were designed for the web, they have been adopted um, for all kinds of digital content. So using Office Accessibility Checker, it checks for color contrast settings according to the WCAG guidelines. Um, things like alt text on images, and I'm going to come on to some of this stuff. That's part of the specification, and it's become kind of the the Bible for accessibility in the digital world, if you like. So what kind of thing do they actually uh, cover? So one of the first things is color contrast. There are some defined ratios that test whether your foreground color works well on your background color. So does text against a background, has it got a nice contrast ratio that can be um, easily read and easily seen? Um, there's kind of two, two levels to this. There's um, double A and there's triple A. The double A spec is kind of like saying, yeah, brilliant, fantastic, you're doing an awesome job, really well done. The AAA level, which is a bit harder to me, it has higher contrast ratio required. That's kind of saying you are a legend, you are absolutely smashing it, you are achieving accessibility awesomeness. Um, aim for AAA, and if you get AA, great. But always work towards AAA because that's probably going to become the standard. Images. So when you put an image on social media or on a website um, or in a document or a PowerPoint deck, a screen reader cannot read um, an image. So a screen reader can read text out. But when it comes to an image, it cannot tell you what that image is. And that's where you can put alt text that describes that image so that a screen reader can come along. So in this case, the QR code on this slide, screen reader will go through and it'll go QR code linking to HTTPS colon backslash backslash link e forward slash 365A11Y, which will take you to lots of links about accessibility. So definitely scan that QR code or click on the link that I post in the chat. Fonts and formatting. It's so easy for us to use really nice, fancy, gorgeous fonts. Um, or we can make use of all that nice Unicode um, hack for getting special fonts in tweets and, and things like that. If you use lots of fancy fonts on screen or on print, people who have difficulty reading, um, they don't need to necessarily have dyslexia. Um, but they might just not have great reading skills or it might be not their first language. Um, or yes, people with dyslexia, they will struggle to read that text. So it's making sure that the fonts are legible, that they're clear, that they're easy to read. That doesn't mean we have to compromise on design or anything. It just means we have to think about it differently. And then formatting, are we using bold? Are we using underline? Are we using header one, two and three in the correct order? Um, and the reason I mentioned using Unicode characters in things like tweets, screen readers cannot read them. 
so if you use those nice characters to you to your eye you can read what it says but a screen reader cannot tell you what they are because a lot of time it's mathematical symbols and things like that so it's just a careful little bit of thinking sometimes about how we do things navigation most people we use a mouse or we use a touch screen but what if you can't what if you use keyboard navigation um when i started in it um in fact when i originally started in it not when i started working in it but as as a kid um there was no graphical user interface everything was keyboard so it was you navigated with keyboard tap first web browser i used links you use the tab key you use the cursor key to navigate through um reading web pages so is the structure of what we do workable using a keyboard i've already mentioned screen readers um you'll be surprised how many people actually use them and then it also defines things like page structures and the tags that we use on our pages and just making sure that things like tables we've not got nested tables oh dear lord please do not nest tables they are horrendous there are a number of tools we can use that help us out so in windows i use windows 11 i have done since the very very first um preview release um Windows 10 also has a huge amount of accessibility tools, but Windows 11 completely stepped up to a whole new level in terms of accessibility. So you've got Windows Narrator, which is your screen reader that's built into Windows. You've got color modes, and I'm going to demonstrate how that affects kind of a, a Power BI report in a little while um but color modes for people with different levels of color vision um or color blindness as people know windows 11 22h2 release introduced live captions which basically means that any audio that comes through your pc you can get subtitles on even if it doesn't include subtitles naturally it is an amazing tool because Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, podcasts, not everything is subtitled and you can get subtitles. And then there are some tools to help with the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, there's a color contrast analyzer that you can download. It's a free tool and it allows you to take a foreground and a background color and tells you whether they match. There's a toolbar from uh, an organization called Web AIM, Web Accessibility in Mind. I always have to remember what that is, called WAVE. And I'll demonstrate that one. And that tests the website to see just where there are issues and where there are potential problems. And then there's Microsoft Accessibility Insights for Web. And again, that does tests on websites to see how accessible they are and it's really really helpful um so really well worth trying those out so i'm going to give you some very quick everyday wins and then we'll get into the power platform um the key thing is that you take the first step and then you take another step and then you take another step and with each individual step you are one step further along than you were before and very soon you're way beyond where you were when you started out so you can start really small with some of these things and there's some very quick wins so hashtags on social media linkedin facebook twitter 
if you put a hashtag all in lowercase, if you've got a long hashtag, even somebody who doesn't have dyslexia is going to struggle to read out what it says. And there are some really high profile examples where people have used all lowercase hashtags and they've been misinterpreted because they actually could say lots of different things, some of which are exceedingly not suitable for a family audience. If you camel case it, if you capitalise the first letter of each word, it means that people with dyslexia and people just generally can very quickly read what that hashtag is saying. The other thing is screen readers, if it's all lowercase, they can't read that hashtag. They don't know where one word ends and another word begins. But if you put capital letters at the beginning of each word, a screen reader can read it. That was my first step into accessibility. A friend challenged me and introduced me to that. And it took me two weeks of consciously thinking about every time I posted a hashtag and then it became a habit. And now I do it without thinking. I it it's just something I do. It involves no extra time. It was a very, very quick win. And it's something I've been doing now for three years plus. And there's probably less than a handful of times where I've not done it. Put alt text on images, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Include alt text, describe what the image is. It doesn't take long to do, and it helps out anybody. Office, it has accessibility checker built into it. Make use of it. It's really, really helpful, not just from an accessibility point of view, but it also helps you understand the structure of your documents and your PowerPoint decks. It can really help with that. And then in Teams and PowerPoint and what have you, use captions, use transcription um, so that people can follow along. So make sure it's enabled, make sure that people can turn it on. It's a very, very simple thing, but it makes a huge amount of difference. So, there we go. That's kind of the, all the, all, all the high level, very quick intro. So, let's get into Power Platform. And Power BI, what can we do in Power BI? Now, these are not everything that you can do for accessibility in these areas. This is just some kind of key things to look at, to focus on, and to take a quick look at. I'm not a Power BI guy. Everybody who knows me knows that I don't do Power BI. Um, so I learned this from a friend when I challenged her on what does accessibility look like? So use of colors. How well does keyboard navigation work? Alt text. Yes, you can actually put alt text on charts. And how many number how, how many items have you got on your dashboard? I've seen some stunningly beautiful dashboards, but they have so much information on them that you cannot consume it all you miss out on what the important information is because there's just too much information and people can feel overwhelmed and then not use it screen readers can just go i'm giving up forget it i just can't cope with this um so really focusing on what's important power pages the new baby the new toy or, well, the new branding anyway. You've got to think about web content accessibility guidelines with power pages. And then it is things like headers using H1, H2, H3. They're not just lazy ways of formatting. They are key things with page structure. Power apps, accessible text or accessible label, tab orders, 
and borders. Um, I'll demo those. Really kind of key things. And then power virtual agents. Yes, PVA. Um, making sure that it's clear text. I've used some chatbots and honestly, oh, I've come away from using those chatbots thinking I have come away knowing less than when I started. Now, for some people who can't use a telephone or can't communicate via Teams, a chatbot might be the only way of interfacing with your organisation. So make sure that the text is clear, make sure it's understandable, make sure that people can follow along with it, that it's very clear and there's no jargon, there's no acronyms and stuff that people don't understand. And images, yeah, you have to use Power Automate with images, but hopefully you never know, they'll come natively. Um, but if you're putting images in your virtual agent, make sure that you've got the text to accompany it as well. I used a chat bot where they showed a product grid, a comparison grid, and they presented it as an image, but there was no text. If I was using a screen reader, I wouldn't know what that product set was. So, Let's take a quick look at Power BI. And before I actually drop into Power BI, I had to use my phone camera because screen grabs don't capture this. But I turned on Windows color filters to simulate or to cater for a couple of different um, color blindness situations. And it kind of shows why color can be quite a key thing. So this one is applying a filter for red, green color blindness. And the thingy and the widget, the orange and the pink, they are very, very close together um, in terms of overall color contrast could be quite difficult to actually separate out. And if I apply a grayscale color filter, what's it and Bob's look identical. They look completely the same. Now that's not to say don't use those colors. It's just to say, make sure that what you've described on your Power BI is clearly visible. So let me drop into Power BI now, if you can find it on his. Uh, da, da, da. So here's Power BI. And yeah, I don't use Power BI much. Um, but I've got the sales value by year area selected. This is just a sample report. It's nothing special. And if I go into the format visualizations and into the general tab, I can add alt text onto this area of my Power BI report. So I can just type in some text that describes the graph. But what's really, really powerful is I can actually use formatting. I can actually use formulas. I can include information. So I don't just have to use static text. Um, if I drop into Power BI on the web, just because same report, um, let me just click into the report very quickly. Let's try some keyboard navigation. If I use the keyboard, and I press the tab key, you can see I'm moving around that report. If I press the question mark character, I get a nice handy pop up that tells me all the keyboard shortcuts I can use with Power BI. But 
some of the ordering you need to think about is this how I want the navigation to flow? Because the order that I'm tabbing through this, so I'm going the header, I'm going color, the sales value by year, sales quantity by product, then product, and then sales value. That's also the same order a screen reader is going to read this. Um, it follows the same order. And it's all to do with it goes left to right, top to bottom in a Z pattern. Um, and yeah, this is probably how you want to do it, but I can go in, I can highlight things. I can, I can use the Power BI report by using the keyboard. The one thing I can't get to is this toolbar here along the top that allows me to filter and focus mode. There's no way of me getting to that with a keyboard. So um, that's kind of one of the ugly things for um, accessibility in Power BI. But if I go in, I can select an item on the chart and I can press Control H and I get the pop-up dialog that shows the breakdown a bit more so i can really use our bi but it's always worth testing this stuff out so then if i come into power pages and i have to say i mean again i'm not a portals guy a power pages guy but i'm loving what i'm seeing with power pages this is just a completely out of the box template that Microsoft supply. And here it is. It looks really quite nice. It's really well designed. How does this look in terms of accessibility? So I've got these two icons. They're Chrome extensions or Edge extensions in this case. This one is. Uh, this one is accessibility insights for web. So I can do some fast pass testing. And it's found that one of the images doesn't have an alt tag, uh, alt text tag. Um, and then there are a few things that it's highlighted in terms of color contrast. I can use this one, which is the wave from web accessibility in mind. And this one, I have to admit, is probably my favorite of them because it provides me a full breakdown on the side. I can see what errors I've got. It highlights them on the page. And then I can go to the detail and it tells me why this is important and how I can fix it. Um, but also it shows me if you watch, you'll see this will flash. It shows me where this error actually is. So in this case, just this little icon here doesn't have alt text. It's not important, but for completion, it would be nice if it was it had alt text. There's a contrast issue here. This text is white. Now it's on an image background, but if that image isn't being displayed, it's white text on a white background. And then you've got things like, are there errors, uh, uh, are there heading tags missing? So this Contoso Limited, it isn't flagged as H1, H2, but it clearly is. I mean, if I if I turn this off. No, no. If I here we go, if I turn it off, that Contoso Limited is a header. So it should be tagged as such. So it's a really useful thing to do, and it's a really good way of testing. 
power apps. Here's a power app. And let me just drop it into a different standard color theme. Here's a quick power app. It's a very basic one, um, albeit with a bit of theming engine applied. If I play this power app, let me just go in. I can navigate using the keyboard. And I've actually got this set so that there's borders on it. Um, so that you can see where I am if I'm using keyboard navigation. How do I do that? Well, it's frustrating actually. So let me let me come to the text input because we all know the properties box. You've got your hover color. You have a hover border color. You've got a normal border color. Hi, my hover is. Yeah, sorry for interruption. I just want to give a time check uh, that um, I would appreciate if you can wrap up in five to ten minutes. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so hover is when you are hovering over it, it gives it a border. Focus border color is what you actually need for when you're tabbing. But it's not on here. The only way of getting to focus border color is here. Now I've got variables in use um, for the theming. But setting that. Um, accessible text. You have your tool tips or your hint text. And on here you've got hint text and tooltip. Um, and then you've got accessible label, which describes it in more depth for screen readers. Um, and what have you. So there are different things you can do with Power Platform. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about learning new habits. So things like that camel case on hashtags, that was a new habit. I don't even think about it now. When you learn new habits, you develop repeatable patterns and those repeatable patterns can become standards that you incorporate into your development practices that then all people working on Power Platform and what have you, they can build to. And when you do that, it makes it much easier because you've got a guideline. But please do not ignore the 1.3 billion. That is a huge number of people. <clears throat> and that only includes those nations that do report these figures. There are some nations that don't. Um, if, if you went to your company and went, there's a country of 1.3 billion people and our software, our, our content um, is not reaching those people. Your bosses will be like, what do we need to do to make it work? We cannot ignore that 1.3. Because that is a humongous number. Same thing applies with accessibility. You ignore accessibility, you're ignoring a huge number of people you are and yeah final thing is nothing about us without us build a culture where people who use accessibility tools can talk to you who can help feed into your development standards the worst form of ableism is able-bodied people thinking they know what disabled people need. That's just not there. There are lots of people out there who use accessibility tools. Quite often they do it without letting anybody know because they feel it's going to hold them back. It's going to cause them issues with their career. Let them know they're safe. Let them know that they're included. 
let them know that they have a voice and that they have an opinion that isn't just a valid opinion, it's one that you really, really need to hear. And then listen to them, include them in the processes, include them in the design, include them in testing, because then you'll build a product that is so much better. You're never going to make it 100% accessible. Perfection is not possible without spending billions of dollars on a sim simple app you're not going to make it because what you do for one person will make it harder for another. But you find a common ground, you find something that works for the majority of your users, that works for the majority of the use cases that you face. But please include people who use these tools. So, um, sorry I didn't get to cover Power Virtual Agents, but that was kind of self-explanatory. Um, very quickly, if anybody's got any questions, I'm going to stick up my uh, links on the screen so that you can scan those and get those again. But if anybody's got any questions, just um, drop them in the chat. Um, I'll post my links in the chat again as well so that you've got those. But has anybody got any questions? OK, I think we're all good. All right, well, if anybody has got any questions or anybody thinks of anything afterwards, just reach out to me, grab me on Twitter, grab me on LinkedIn, connect with me. I'm happy to connect with everybody. Um, message me. I'm more than happy to reply to messages, jump on calls, whatever, to help out um, and give guidance. Um, but thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the event. Um, thank you to the organisers and the sponsors. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the uh, rest of your day everybody <laughs>